Hello, thank you very much for coming and welcome to Cooper Gallery. My name is Sophia Yadonghao and I lead the program here at the Cooper Gallery. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here joining us today to celebrate the opening of Cooper Gallery's new exhibition, Chimera, by our artist duo, Rosalind Nashishibi and Lucy Scare. So it has been an exciting, extremely exciting and stimulating journey working on these projects with the artists. And I'm really thrilled to finally have, after several years of remote discussions and the development, Lucy and Rosalind here at Cooper Gallery in person, <laughs> eventually. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, so what, um, so the, ex, um, the in conversation this evening will take about 30 minutes. And then we will have uh, uh, 15 minutes for audience to respond and uh, ask questions. And then this will be followed by a drinks reception and when you will have the opportunity to experience the exhibition but also um, have a chat with the artists, and we will be around then. So now it gives me a um, great pleasure to introduce the creative mind and hand uh, responsible for transforming our senses with this lucid and evocative exhibition. So Lucy and Rosalind, uh, each have distinctive practices. Lucy is an interdisciplinary sculptor and Rosalind, a filmmaker and a painter. Well, together they make um, films as Nashashibi Scare. So Lucy and Rosalind met in Glasgow and uh, began working together back in 2005 uh, with your first joint work called The Ambassador which was shown at Cuba Gallery in 2017. And apart from the films they make collaboratively, they also exhibit works from their individual practices together. So their films have been shown internationally to critical acclaim at venues such as the Berlin Binali 5, Documenta 14, Tate Britain, Tate St. Knives, the Metropolitan Museum of Art New York, the Carnegie Museum of Art, Pittsburgh, and the ICA, London. In 2019, Nashashibi Scare had a major exhibition entitled Future Sun at SMAC in Ghent. So this brought together their solo practices and the collaboration for the first time. So their recent film, Lamb, led to their first collaboration with composers and musicians. Their new film, Bear, a sequel to Lamb, was produced and premiered as a part of a Cooper Gallery's international project, uh, Current Contemporary Art from oh. Scotland in China last year. Through this opportunity, the artist collaborated with uh, Cantonese opera singer Zhu Pei Li on the production of a stunning soundtrack. Um, although the version of uh, this film, um, this version of the film is not included in this exhibition, but we will screen it uh, as a part of a vocal improvisation performance uh, featuring Scottish-Turkish composer Jilan Hay and the Japanese composer Shiori Usui on Thursday, 20th of October. I hope you will sign up for that event. So now, Lucy and Rosalind. So let's start with the title, Chimera. So I'm just reading out a dictionary <coughs> entry. According to Oxford English Dictionary, Chimera is a monstrous creature in ancient Greek mythology, a female goat with a lion's head, a goat's body, and a snake's tail and that are breathing out fire. It also means an unrealizable dream or hope. So could you talk about a little bit um, what does Chimera signify in this exhibition? Um, that's okay. Uh, can you hear me okay with this? Okay, great. Um, I think that, that um, 
in some ways, Chimera um, is interesting to us because it brings together different parts to make something that is beforehand impossible, but then after is kind of lodged in the imagination and in the in the mind. And in some ways, we when we approach our films and our exhibitions, we try to bring different things together. Um, to, to make some kind of transformation and to make a new whole. Um, and I think that, that, um, there's been a kind of recurring interest in our work in mythology, um, and both kind of historic mythology and current mythology. Um, and yeah, I would, I would say Chimera is this kind of, um, bringing together different parts into a, a, a creature that you can still understand like you can still understand that it has a head you can still understand that it has legs even though the head and the legs are different so it still has a kind of logic to it but, uh, um, I think, um, we talked a little bit about this so it's th that's you know in terms of uh, the chimera um and I also thought Chimera operates as a kind of philosophical uh, method um, that uh, brings together different modes of uh, thought, just as you kind of already uh, explained, including um, the surreal and the rational or the classificatory or uh, the outsider ways of beings um, all together, but without any hierarchies. So I just wondered, I'm really interested in this idea of, uh, um, you know, this sort of inherent discursiveness or we say multiplicity of ideas as a working method. You know, how does this sort of working method manifest in your collaborative practice? The idea of Chimera is, um, that's well put, that it's also like a, a methodology. Um, because uh, when we work together, and, and the way the reason we started working together and continue to work together is that we, um, we run with certain thoughts that we have, and then the, uh, almost like a game of consequences or something, but it's not, so, it's, it's not that we're, we're sort of, a bit like this film, Our Magnolia, one of us will suggest something and that will lead the other one to an association and they will suggest something and then we put those things together and we kind of trust one another. So this is kind of like, you could say like this beast of many parts, but we allow this sort of associative way of working. But also, I guess, Mira also is very suggestive of these kind of transformative potentials. So when you bring all these different ideas or different parts together, and there's always room for something uh, unknown or unexpected to happen. So I wonder if, if that's how you interact with each other. That um, there's something that I learned a lot from our first collaboration, which was Ambassador, which was we shot in the. Um, ambassador's house in Hong Kong shortly after the handback of Hong Kong. And, um, and we didn't have that much of a plan apart from to try to make some portrait of the ambassador. But what we had to do was just be very, very focused and very attuned to whatever was happening while we were there and just kind of tune in the mind during the film shoot. And that's something that I think Rosie had had from her practice before that I learned from her, just how to stay in that moment with your idea and be responsive and be open. And I think that that's maybe um, a way that I work when I'm in installing objects is that I try to have a similar kind of openness and concentration um, and my feeling is that we both bring that in slightly different ways to the collaboration and we're just kind of, we to be tuned in but not try to exclude or um, settle. So 
as you've seen, like we've been making, we've been moving the things even around today, and we it's quite a dynamic process um, for us. So, yeah, I think I think like a kind of strange, strange beast is quite a good, <laughs> good kind of analogy. And that our collaboration is really based on us allowing each other in to our own practices as well as what we make together. So um, during the install, um, I made these works behind us and Lucy brought the sculptures that she'd made for this show and made these additions and we kind of placed them together and we changed things in each other's works, you know, and I think that is what makes it really exciting for me to work with Lucian, apart from the things that we do when we're making, but also particularly when we're installing, that we can feed in. And I appreciate the fact that in our collaboration, Lucy often responds to something that I've done before and, and that she will then say, oh, let's do this because what you did there opens up that possibility. And in my own work, I often think, well, you know, what would Lucy do? <laughs> I think we all do that with our artists kind of you know yeah, friends yeah. and I think it's an interesting thing when we came to we curated a show of other artists at, at um, Tate's and Ives and in some ways we were kind of trying to think through their work like trying to almost like you could kind of attach their mind onto your mind and I think that's a kind of um, a very active way to experience artworks actually like you can follow the the logic or follow the aesthetic or 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 just use the artwork in some way and I think that that stems from the way that we work with each other and each other's practice. Um, what I try to say is that I feel Camera also you know provides the space not only for the possibilities and all sorts of potential to happen but also allows uh, slippages of the meaning and context uh, to happen as well. So that's quite interesting. It creates a new space, new dialogues, and a new interactions. So sometimes not even expected. Now, what I um, experienced this uh, this week and installing with you guys here, um, it's quite interesting to see the conversations not only between yourself, but that how those works are having conversation, constant conversations with you two and between themselves as well. And, uh, and I feel a lot of um, ideas or um, understandings or interactions I never had with your work um, <coughs> happened in the past three days. It's quite interesting to see how this exhibition is being brought together actually unexpected to me um, as well. So thank you very much um, for this unexpected uh, delight and the pleasure. So now I want to move yeah. on to that film, um, Our Magnolia. So um, Our Magnolia draws on a painting by a British surrealist, the painter Paul Nash, um, which is a painting called Flight of the Magnolia. Um, he created in 1944. So in the following year, Nash published an essay, uh, Area of Flowers, in which he states a love of the monstrous and uh, magical. So that's uh, an essay uh, Lucy introduced to me, and I found this quite interesting. Um, he talks about his dream of a flying and how that is uh, fundamentally different from the reality of a flight. Uh, during wartime. And while well, as a painting, he described himself as an imaginative interpreter rather than a documenter of aerial combat. But Paul Nash was also a war artist, commissioned war artist. So my question is how your film, Our Magnolia, expands on Nash's spirit of uh, imaginative interpreter. Um, so uh, we we um, started with the painting. We, you know, that was absolutely like the first uh, part of the shoot, <clears throat> which we um, shot in Tate, was in the members' room. 
and we just allowed the painting to take us onto this journey of associations, which is a bit like what I was mentioning earlier. Um, and we used Paul Nash's sort of methodology of um, a kind of surrealist approach to making political work. So work about war in this case. So the painting Flight of the Magnolia um, is this magnolia in the sky sort of looks like an explosion, but he described it as the thought in the fear that people had of enemies coming into the sky out parachutes, you know, in the Second World War, the parachutes sort of blossoming in the sky and coming down to England. So um, there was this connection between this sort of surrealist approach of Magnolia in the sky and the politics of war and, and then also this connection to landscape, which is throughout this particular show that Lucy and I have done. Um, and we, we did it in a quite permissive way in that we said, okay, our magnolia, and I think we were sat on a bench at the tape when we were doing the shoot, when we, we talked about, we started saying Maggie and then Maggie Thatcher and then, you know, we sort of made this association, um, Margaret Thatcher photographs appear in the film, we made this association and we allowed that to be in the film and that led us to um, other images that are in the film related to, um, but from the second Gulf War, it was kind of legacy of Thatcher and Reagan, but also um, more visual associations like the back of this man's head and ear um, and the light behind, almost like the light of the sky, the ear like the magnolia. Um, and, and then also this really current moment of, of looking at Google and scrolling through Google, which is like such a, it, it really dates the work in a particular time and probably also that monitor looks quite unlike the monitors that we use now. So I think we, we were also really um, conscious of like very precisely um, um, moving forward through time because of course when we were talking about our magnolia, first we were talking about the flower and then we were talking about Maggie the word Maggie and how it sounds like Magnolia, but we were also thinking about like the texture of her hair, like this hairspray hair, and the way that she appeared through our childhoods as this kind of real spectre. Like when we got out these photographs of Margaret Thatcher as she was during her prime minister time, it was like shocking and like weirdly nostalgic to see them. So like those images had a power um, to them for us because of our memories um, and, and the kind of iconography of, of our time. And that also, um, you know, is to do to me is to do about um, to do with how we read history. You know how history um, connects with the present day. When I was watching our Magnolia, you know the several different events being collaged together. It's really reminded me how Walter Benjamin and discusses history, you know, the, the history of the uh, present. But it's quite interesting, um, while we're preparing um, this exhibition, I came across a text uh, about post-colonial theories and a feminist activist, uh, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, um, which for me resonates really beautifully with how you work with history, not only through this one film, but in your other work uh, as well. Uh, Spivak writes, and I quote, to think of historical reading as a relay race, entering it with great uh, sympathy and locating a moment there. That will allow one to turn the narrative around against itself with no excuse no accusations, but a new news. You take the button and move, and this is an active approach to reading history. The past never finishes its vanishing present. So I always feel that's really beautifully resonant with how you work um, with history. And then it came out, this, this text, only a couple of weeks ago, um, 
when I was reading a book that she wrote in the 90s. <coughs> I just feel like everything that she writes is how you work in your practice. I so, think um, it, that it's quite, it's quite interesting to um, have this, uh, like a lot of our films um, really refer to the present moment, like that the present moment doesn't become a kind of illusion in some ways. Like, um, our second film that we made was called Flash in the Metropolitan and it was made in the Metropolitan Museum in the dark and it had like a pulsating light that would just fall on the object every few seconds and you became very aware of this like new time scale of only the present, only the present in the film and only the present in the museum kind of overlapping. And I think also one of the reasons that we were drawn to Flight of the Magnolia as a painting is that it seems like an event that's that's constantly becoming, like it's constantly forming in front of your eyes. And so it has the quality of an event and we're interested in what happens if we put that on film. So yeah, I think it's it's interesting to think about about history being kind of constantly made um, live again, constantly being made made present. Because history only makes sense as to the viewpoint of the present, I think. Um, so that's it, it's quite interesting to think about, and also this idea of a constellation of events in the um, discourse of history. You know how the events conjure together and affects, impacts, influence our reading of our present day. And the interest in this film is extremely pertinent at the moment, given our current political, social, mm -hmm. economic context. Um, yeah, I should say that we're not fans of Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> Although there's a, yeah, here we go. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, now um, I would like to talk about the sound, because we know the film Lamp Downstairs, that's the first piece you collaborated with musicians and uh, um, composers. Um, it feels like it plays quite an important role, not only in that film, but also in Bear, when you toured the Bear in China and uh, um, you worked with uh, the Cantonese, um, traditional Cantonese um, opera singers. Um, to me, the, the sound and the music composition in both films uh, really shapes the images and the guys the images and the almost uh, giving kind of a new reading you when know, you have the sound or without the sound the reading of the images are quite different so could you talk a little bit about the intention your intention for using those particular elements of sound because i know it's actually quite a complex those elements you use or man and how you deploy them we should just um, clarify that, that during the install um, of this room, we decided to remove the soundtrack from Bear that we had, um, that we'd shown the, the work with before. And it was a really beautiful um, soundtrack made by a, a Cantonese opera singer um, that was made in collaboration. And it, the reason that we decided not to um, play it in this room is because um, when we when we removed the soundtrack, we felt that a lot of different readings were became possible, um, and so it was a kind of um, a decision to sacrifice the the kind of effectiveness of of bear in order to open up new associations in the room between the different elements in the painting, and just so everything had more space so i guess that's like one of the one of the examples of us always trying to be present for for the thing that we're doing and, and adapting works and changing works um as we go but uh yeah maybe you want to say something about yeah about I that. involved in that soundtrack Yes, I worked um, with the British composer Olivia Ray, um, sorry, opera singer Olivia Ray and composer William Carsley to, to make that soundtrack. And three of us kind of did it together, um, the film Downstairs, Lamb. And um, I mean, I think this is 
you know, there's definitely a collage element to all these films, in a sense. So there's uh, that sort of methodology, which collage um, is also close to a sort of type of surrealism. And so I think with the film downstairs, you see more um, straight, um, unaltered, let's say, um, shots of sheep in a lambing shed giving birth. And the soundtrack, you hear Olivia singing the word lamb, and it's a sort of birthing of the word and the birthing of the animal. And I think that language, in a way, is sort of an examination of, of the language by looking at the act. I mean, the connection between the act and the word is some kind of an active, exciting connection. So just that lamb, and she sings it, and obviously very beautifully. And, and then there's the breath that goes through a trumpet. So you hear the breath of a trumpet and occasionally a kind of one um, note, this plucked note of a cello, I think it was, which gives this sense of the time and the repetition of the event of the lambing every year at the same time. So it was another layer in which to kind of explain what we mean, I suppose. And I think in this film, in Bear, um, the, the other layer really is the animation, which you see that works in a similar way to the, the, the way that the sound works downstairs in Lamb. So um, there's two types of animation. One in which, so we shoot all our films on 16 millimeter. And in this film, we drew directly onto the film. That's the kind of big black lines you see. And we also commissioned um, a graduate of this school, Regina Ohak, to make digital animation, which you see in the lighter white lines. Um, and the animation shows the contour of a bear over the sheep or over the lap, newly born lamb. And this is the, um, this kind of suggestion. In a way, it's also to do with language. It's like lamb means this, bear means this, but actually, you know, we superimpose them and we make this new kind of language or sentence out of them. So, I mean, it's quite abstract, but eventually becomes somewhat bear. <laughs> and to talk a bit more about the situation with the show in Shenzhen, we, um, because we were sending the work out, we couldn't go because of the COVID situation. So we sent the work and we wanted to make some sort of connection with the place and for that to alter the work. And so we were, you know, we were really happy to show that work um, in Chen Chen with, with the soundtrack. soundtrack. Um, but it, it certainly has a different meaning in every context that you show it in, I think. Yeah, so then we started. Like Simon filmed that might have a soundtrack that's specific for the place that it's in. But then, like, just talking between us, we, we kind of like the silence in the film as well because it already has this other element. And also just to say that, that the, the, the films were filmed at two separate lambing seasons. So it's like I kind of go down the road and, and hang out in the lambing sheds for, for April one year and then April the, the <coughs> following year and, and the following year was the year of, of lockdown so it was just a very different year um, and, and so we made a very different outcome. Also to, to let you know just in case um, you're wondering there is some sound on our magnolia there's a very short piece of sound at one point in the film which you'll be able to hear later. We just turned it off for the talk. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I was going to ask you about the, the drawing elements in your work, but then it feels like you already talked about it. And to me, um, yesterday we talked about it, to me, um, your works are all very sculpture, including your paintings. Um, of course, Lucy's a sculpture already in there. And the films are quite sculpture. Um, by using all these marks, if we say, not just in particular drawings, uh, onto the films. And I know these are hand-drawn uh, outlines and the drawings and the digital drawings, but that one, um, there's some really visceral kind of marks on that film. Can you talk a little bit 
from that and the marks on the film. Um, yeah, I mean, when, when we were thinking about what works to would, would be good to show together in, in one room, I think one of the key deciding factors was, was the way that both films have this these handmade marks in them. I mean, in uh, Magnolia, there's Paul Nash's painting, which um, which is obviously completely central, but, but like the film really shows the quality of those marks. And then, um, and then this film also has like drawn image in quite a kind of visceral way. So, so I think like that kind of handmade mark was really central to both, to the idea of putting these films together to see like what you, what you can make over the photographic like what you can make that changes the meaning of the photographic. Um, and then also the, there's an, an obliteration of the painting at the end of the film, whether it's kind of an obliteration of the film itself, but you, you lose the painting of, of our Magnolia, and then it kind of recovers a bit, and then it goes again. So it's this kind of um, um, wearing out of the image. And you really experiment with the materiality of all your works, including the painting behind the mask and the sculpture on the floor. And that sculpture, um, Sleep Night, right? <laughs> the title. And uh, the drawing, the chalk drawing on the sculpture only happened yesterday. Um, and then I was thinking about, am I right? to say um, you also use the sand to treat the film, the physical film. Yeah, yeah we, we um, just held sandpaper on the film as it was going through the projector, so it made all of these vertical scratches, yeah. So that, that's quite interesting in relation to mark making and the drawing, because think of Jordan Stone, only this year we started a new MA course, <coughs> the MA in drawing. So I think a lot of people in the room are very interested to hear or your processes in the mark making and the drawing. Um, I think now it's the time for us to open to the floor for questions or responses. Um, unless you have any additional um, points you would like to Um, so it's really interesting hearing about how you work with each other and how you have come up with a process of working and it's almost like you said, like the kind of game of association and how that's, there's quite a lot of trust in that from the both of you because you can be completely open and uh, kind of come up with the ideas organically that way. And I was wondering about when you work with other musicians and um, other artists or how you interact with the other people that are um, worked with, the, with you on the films, is it the same kind of process or are people reacting to the images that you've already decided upon? Um, uh, like, do you still have that kind of, um, kind of open process and association with the other people that you work with? Does it make sense? Uh, yeah, I think it's dif different. I think that the way that we work together is built up over time and it's particular and there is um, there's this sort of back and forth in it and in those examples here we work with I mean the composer in China we work with was obviously very remote we never met them and we never actually had a conversation with them but we sent notes back and forth a bit um, and with the piece downstairs we we both know the, the singer quite well, Olivia, by chance. We both know her. I know her through living in Finsbury Park, and Lucy's somewhat related to her by yeah, chance. She's kind of my cousin. Yeah, <laughs> but that was really completely bizarre. But um, we, it's, it's different, because, but it, I mean, we do, we definitely give that person a lot of agency, and we also work with a printer who, um, in China who made film poster for Bear, which is outside, and we ask them to respond to it. In the case of Olivia, I work with them quite closely, but in the other two cases, they produce something 
and just came back to them. We didn't come back to them on what they produced at all. We just accepted it happily. Um, so we were open to, to other people's intervention, but it's not the same process. I just just wondered if you ever if a day would ever come where you feel this is finished, I'm not going to change it again, to this point which you see your work as being finished, or if it's always open to additions and changing. I think it could be finished, but then it could be reopened. <laughs> you know, we could think it is finished, but then it would never be impossible. Because the nice thing about collaborating, I think is that you give each other permission in a way that it's more difficult sometimes when you're working alone, so say, okay, I said this was done, am I now gonna reopen it? Obviously, when the work is sold, it's kind of too late, but um, I think we interpret the work anew every time we show it, and uh, we're in dialogue, you know, and we're not in dialogue when we're working alone, if you see what I mean? So there's that extra opportunity to to sort of say, you know, the last minute, what, could we do this differently? And knowing the other one is not gonna say, oh, shut up, it's too late, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's something about, about that we don't collaborate together all the time. So we have these kind of lapses between projects that we don't look at our work or, or talk about our work or really think about it, maybe. And, um, and I think that that allows us a kind of return to it, which, but, but there are some thought, I mean, like we haven't revisited any other films, have we? I think. Oh no, we have a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it's really fun to revisit things, you know, because they change over time. And seeing this film, and seeing Margaret Thatcher today is different, and we made this in 2009. Um, and in the recent months, so many politicians have seemed to want to be Thatcher, you know. And, and then again today, you know, it changes again, and the, the war situation changed. And so this film is, has changed, and we haven't touched it, you know. So I think in the case of some other films, we notice things that we no longer feel quite are quite right, and we we would change them. But there's different ways in which works change. Let's put it like that. But also, I think in the exhibition context, you know, always provides the discourses context around your previous works, and it gives a new meaning and a new kind of interaction. And I think, you know, for example, Bear, when we showed in China last year, that's completely different. Um, interpretation mm -hmm. and then um, when the film was just installed here and we decided for it to be silent I was a little bit surprised but then when all the other work started building up and more and more I understand the reason behind it it's an absolutely artist decision so all this work <laughs> but also provide a really new, interesting context um, for this particular show uh, at Cooper Gallery as well. So I'm really grateful you know, we're having a brand new exhibition and a brand new bear here. But also, I mean, Lucy's shown haystacks before, but never like this. Yeah. You know, it was new for this show, but going this way and um, I think yeah, that's that's kind of why we, we do it. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, I think also um, not not to go on too long, but but the uh, the work the the exhibition that we made in Smack in Ghent was the first time that we showed our individual works with the collaborative films, and I think that was just very important for a lot of the works that I've been developing over the past like two years have been, had their kind of seeds in that show that we made together. So I think there was something that, that made us both more open or more experimental in our own practice 
as well that deserves the collaboration. Yeah, I, I think there's a long time ago, because um, the Cooper Gallery always held this interesting collaborative practice. And many years ago, eight years ago, um, we invited Lucy and your another collaborative group for the Henry A's Wives presented your work here. And through that exhibition, um, we discuss a lot about the, the convergence and the divergence in the collaborative group. And uh, I remember a lot of artists said at that time, um, it's actually not the convergence always exactly, it's actually the divergence um, could stimulate a lot of new ideas. So do you have disagreement all the time? Or? Not all the time. <laughs> Quite rarely. I mean, it seems like we, we need um, we need to have like a kind of like count to ten before you <laughs> before you react. But I think usually with with given like even quite a short amount of time, like a few hours, like we will think through something that had initially felt very like jarring, and then come around to understanding the position. Well, that's how it's, I mean, we work, um, yeah, we don't really talk that much. Really. <laughs> like, we just um, to, to have like a kind of shorthand to arrive at a decision. And I don't think we've ever felt um, unhappy with the, or like that we've compromised in the, the work. I guess that, that that's an idea of a collaboration always brings in this kind of endless potential and the possibilities. And then you're quite open to that uh, uh, situation. I mean, we definitely have our disagreements in the edit often, I think. And that's because the edit point is which, you know, in our Magnolia, I shot some of it, Lucy shot some of it. Lucy shot the other two films that the Ramming shared on Lewis, where she lives. And um, we both edit, and um, sometimes editing is an intuitive process. And you know, you say, well, I remember one conversation we had of like, why is the dog in it? You know, and say, well, I have to have the dog in it. Why? Try without the dog. Okay. Yeah, we have to have the dog. You know, it's just like there's nothing. There's no reason. But it's, you know, and sometimes that can be jarring because the other one's like, no, eh, they don't want it like this, you know, but then it's just about not getting, yeah, well, it's just relationships it's, really. Yeah, but there's also like a kind of maybe a fight between like what the, what the, um, the idea was before it was made and what the idea is as it's made and, and as it becomes its thing within our, its own logic, yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I think La Lamb Bear are incredibly beautiful. And I've had lots of uh, um, conversations with kind of 16 million filmmakers. And in particular, we've always discussed the kind of cleanliness and beauty of the images. And it's a really practical, silly question. But what lenses or did you use to shoot Lamb and Bear? Because they're, they're, I think they. The kind, of, the kind of image making uh, of 16 million is such a kind of intense process and can be so, so very particular. And oftentimes you get very soft images, and on occasion you can often have kind of contingencies. And Tassa de Dean talks a lot about capturing those uh, contingencies. But the kind of endless fascination I have with the film and being in these films is a kind of personal uh, relation to them because of the way they've been shot. So I wonder if you could say what lines is uh, you shot these films. I know this is a really embarrassing question, but... Uh, um, they're, they're shot with a, with a Bolex um, camera, and they, they're using prime lenses, and um, I think it's a, a, a 10, a, a wide angle, and then a 50 and a 75, but not very much anything in between. So there's there's quite a kind of um, quite a, a jump between um, the wide shots and then quite close up shots. The nice thing about the Bolex, the nice thing about the Bolex camera is is that you um, 
you have a turret, you know, and you can turn with the three lenses on it and you just can switch the turret between one, two, and three. So you can shoot quite fast, which was the innovation in the 1960s of Rolex cameras for, for a news shooting that you could quickly switch between lenses and uh, load and unload the film. Um, this is just, this is a kind of, uh, just when you're talking about the edit, the effect of running the sandpaper over the, um, over the film, I mean, it's quite a destructive act. And I was wondering, like, did you agree on doing that? And also, did you only have, like, one shot at doing it? Because I don't know, like, I don't know how film works, if you've got loads of rolls of film, or if you've just got, like, okay, let's do it, that's the film, sanded permanently now. <laughs> We did. I remember it was quite a kind of um, step to do that to the film because um, <laughs> because it was like such a kind of structural filmmaker's move, and um, I think that you were pretty uncomfortable with that, like that reference to like physicality of film. But um, but not I for don't that remember long. That. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it coming from that we made flash in the Metropolitan. We were flashing the lights in the museum on these, and you know, these objects under glass. And then we decided at some point to use the light to sort of, instead of illuminate, to annihilate the object. So there'd be so much light that you, you, you would be blind, you couldn't see it anymore. And I understood, see, we probably never talked about it, but I understood the scratching of the film as a sort of doing the same to the image. And in fact, we did it twice because we did it and then we decided it wasn't enough. Yeah. And we did it a bit more. Yeah, like sometime, <coughs> like a few months later. No, that's a good thing. Yeah, and and also I think like in that in that film the the shots of the woman in the Iraq museum are from when the when the museum was looted and and she's the curator and she's so distressed at the at the like annihilation of these. Object. So I think there was also this kind of idea of of, um, yeah. of destruction or, or yeah mm -hmm. that we were responding to. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, I don't really know where I'm going with this question, um, but I was just listening really with a lot of interest to what you say about the way your process work, the association of ideas that you have that spark off each other in a kind of conversational way that is part of that collaborative aesthetic. Um, I was thinking also that association is marked in time. It's, a, it's actually born of a certain space and time. Um, mark making itself is born of a certain space and time. You, you make marks at a certain time, you know, a, certain asp, you know, a certain location and a certain time. And the films are time-based art as well. So I, this is a kind of strange question because at the end of it, I'm asking you if um, art itself or the film, whether your aesthetics is to sabotage time, because art itself becomes atemporal when you actually show it. it you know, it, it loses that sense of location, of mark making, and becomes something else altogether. So is imaginative time atemporal for the kinds of work that you are showing here? Um, Abstractions, of course, aren't quite as located in time and space because they are abstract. They don't have as many of those markers. But I just wondered whether, it, I, I, I don't actually know whether this is a question or not, but it's just a series of observations. <laughs> we probably react to that completely differently because it's such an open question, but it was making me think about how that quote that Sophia said about the history being a baton that's passed on. And up until these last two films, everything we've done has really been about artwork, other artworks. And we've been taking those artworks and kind of running with them. And it's been in a way an act of possession, saying, okay, these are ours now and we can do what we want with them. Like what would happen if, so this is a kind of bring it to the, to the present, yes, but it, it'll leap into history, but it's also an act of possession, I think. Yeah, I think, I think that's, uh, I remember 
for Flash in the Metropolitan, we had to get permission per object in the museum. Um, and I remember it being like, like almost that we were able, we were like shopping in the, in the museum. We were like, we can, we can have, we can have or borrow um, or use. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I would say that we're very aware of the, of the, Temporality and the and the the mark making, but it comes up in different ways in in different films. But I would say like nearly always, we don't use the film as like a kind of transparent medium that's like just looking through a window onto a world. Like you're always aware that you're that that there is uh, manipulation there. Like like with. Um, uh, Magnolia, when you see the actual film disintegrating, um, or in Bear, where you see the the frame by frame, how it's impossible to make a, a static drawing in the same time scale as the film runs. Mm. I suppose my sense is whether reader come, whether viewer comes to your 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 time based on your films, there is a kind of strange sense of another different time almost. It's almost as if time doesn't actually, it isn't clock time. I mean, we don't know all of the associations unless you explain it to us in terms of, you know, like Maggie Thatcher's hair when you were talking about it with each other. All of that's lost in the moment of us viewing that without your contextual explanation. So I, I'm just obsessed with time and what we do with time and how we explain time to ourselves and how history is caught up in time, but history is also strangely in the Benjamin kind of um, quote that you have, erupts out of the past into the present. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's a very kind of stream of consciousness. This modernist time that we're referring to in, in uh, Magnolia. And then, and then the land and the bear are, are a seasonal kind of time. Um, yeah. Uh, Lucy's point about stream of consciousness, I mean, we were both kind of big Virginia Woolf fans and could both relate to the sense of time in um, the waves or to the lighthouse or Mrs. Dalloway, you know, the sense of a moment that's strung out or, you know, a leap in time. It's like, it's very, it's material that we work with. Also like I guess um, in terms of uh, the exhibition making context, so the relationship between, that's again with Virginia Woolf, um, this whole idea of a three-way relationship. So spectators always have that agency as well. So um, I think, you know, that that's kind of a three-way relationship between um, the author, the artist, and uh, the artwork, and the spectators. So that, that, that there is always a kind of constant negotiation um, within the discourse of time, and how we understand time. Thanks. Um, following on a little bit from that, but some of the language that you used this evening, and um, the, the name of the, the show, Chimera, it being a uh, a she goat, a uh, young she goat, and it being a, also a creature that is, is uh, linked to winter, and as you talked about revisiting the, you know, the lambing season, you know, this, this, this year being marked in, in birth of uh, new animals. But, you know, the, also when you talked about the specter of Maggie Thatcher, um, the possession of these objects, but also being kind of uh, something which you're illuminating as a kind of spectre, but, but also kind of then fades. Um, and the, what happens with the, the mark making and the grotesque ways that you're, you're making these monsters, these collages of, of different creatures, some imagined, some overlaid on, on top of one another, and some, I'm not sure if it's true, um, whether it's the skin of another animal on, on one of the lambs. So is being kind of affected by um, another kind of dead animal in order for that bond to be made. But I suppose, especially at the moment where there is a kind of nostalgia for 
what seems like a kind of horrific past in, in the UK, um, which has just been uh, amplified recently um, with our kind of being, uh, well, maybe a sense of, how, of being forced to feel a certain way um, to the kind of news media inflicting, I think, something upon us to, to feel in a certain way. And I wondered if, if you could talk a little bit about that, this, the chimera, the, the grotesque collage of animals and creatures, and we're seeing it with our politici politicians at the moment, who are enacting that by wearing the skins of, <laughs> of, of other wraiths that have, that have haunted uh, our country before. Sorry, this is getting very... Um, <laughs> But you're all with me, right? Yeah. Uh, but but there is there is something else that we we talked a lot about the kind of time-based stuff. But there's there's also the presence of the objects and and, and the uh, the paintings on the walls. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that about the kind of feeling that you that you've described about working together? The kind of a lot of the stuff that's unspoken. Maybe something to do with with that feeling, I suppose, between the pair of you, and also in how you're responding to. A certain time, which you talked about remaining open in almost a way that it can con continually be filled up, haunted repeatedly by time. Um, thank you for those, those comments and those observations. And I think, um, yeah, the, the, the lamb is wearing the, the skin of a, of a previous lamb that hadn't survived, so it gets adopted. And I think that is quite a kind of pertinent um, idea for, for our times. It seems that we just had Churchill and now we yeah, have Thatcher. Um, I think um, the, the drawing, and I, I think that at the heart of, of, um, of our collaboration is a kind of sen a sensuality and a, a um, joy in the way that things look or the way that they are. Um, and then obviously that's also, um, there's a lot of other factors that, that we're bringing in to do with like politics or, or history. But I think that the thing that, that um, makes the work cohere for me is this um, play of, of materials and of a visual language, like an insistence on a visual language over another rationality. So I, I would say um, that is how it feels to bring these objects into the space. Yeah, I think that's really well put. I think that we, um, Lucy said earlier that we don't talk that much when we're working and I think that we do trade in images and objects and um, when I when we arrived on Monday I had asked for brown packing paper and pigments and started making these paintings but they were in response to the objects and films that Lucy brought that we had made um, and you know, I don't need, I, I certainly, there was no need for either of us to sort of question what the other was doing or ourselves were doing in that. So that is a different, need to go back to the previous question, it's kind of a different sense of time, but there's a time of the films, making the films, there's a time of the making of the sculptures, and there's a time of what happens right here, and that's um, what you see. Um, these, you know, pieces are called gates and relate to this kind of rural setting also, there's, the sea and um, the space, this space we're in, and the time we have, because they were, it's like, you know, what I say, like the throw of a dice, you know, it's everything that affects the throw at the time when you make it, really. So that's like, again, an iteration of a moment and an act of trust. I think that acts of the trust is really important, and it is, you know, um, the acts of uh, friendship uh, throughout your, your practices, not only between yourself, but how you work with the others as well. You know, bring your cousin in, for example. <laughs> um, 
And I, I think the, you know, just in response, it's from Marvin point a little bit to the idea of this chimera, this monstrous creature. I think it's ex extremely exciting, not only because of the materiality, the different types and uh, materiality, but also um, the multiple agencies brought into this space, you know, into the now and the here is quite interesting. And it's very stimulating in the way how we um, move around the objects and from different angles, how we view the images from the moving image and the images on the wall, the painting on the wall, and how we relate uh, the slave night to the gate over there. I think the narrative is constantly moving, and that's what I meant earlier on, these slippages of meaning and context all brought together. Um, so that's endless narrative and re readings. So I, I would I really encourage everybody to come back when there's a quiet moment and uh, to experience uh, these multiple time and spaces uh, in this space. So I think that's perhaps a quiet moment for us to uh, round up uh, tonight's in conversation and uh, I believe the drinks are ready outside for you to enjoy but please do not bring the drinks into the gallery space because we do have very fragile athletes here and um, we will be around as well if you would like to have a chat with us but please join me to give a applause around